quite a few people already who have been come in now and so just to kind of as a if anyone hasn't actually joined this is um imaging one world lecture series and we have speakers from all over the world um, teaching us about their imaging methods this can include applications of imaging techniques but also i think a focus for us has been um, so far really on imaging techniques development or people who really kind of create their own systems but also software i think we had a focus and but we would be very happy if anyone wanted to speak about um also just how they apply imaging techniques i think we had like maybe um like organoid imaging was actually a lot more about how you um use developmental biology applications and imaging to solve those rather than just developing a new system and I think the speaker today is also just kind of I can tell people to actually give this um, real credit and a lot of respect because some of our speakers, including Sapun today, they get up super early and have small kids who kind of um, really have to speak very quietly um, to not wake them up. And it's a real pleasure that they and we're very, very grateful that people agree to speak in this lecture series and tell us what they're doing. So Kirti is going to provide an introduction to Sapun briefly. I mean, people maybe know anyway. I think you're very famous. I got a few emails. Um, I mean, I know, we all know you from papers. And so <laughs> that's great. <laughs> but maybe a short introduction, Kirti. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, I have worked with uh, Sapun before, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Sapun. So Sapun did his bachelor's uh, from Texas and then uh, he moved to Berkeley for his PhD. And then he spent some time in National Institute for Science and Technology. And then uh, in a very short span, he got a group leader position at Max Planck in, in Mainz. I think where he still holds a adjunct position and now he's again a full professor at, at Texas. So Sapun is super passionate as you will see from his talk. And uh, I think I have given him tough, some tough time in the past <laughs> with a few collaborative papers, but uh, looking forward to a great talk for him from him. And yeah, Sabun, yeah. Still a few papers that we are still supposed to write, yeah. right? <laughs> Five years on, um, but thanks, <laughs> thanks very much for the introduction. Kirti and uh, Stephanie and all the organizers for inviting me to be here. I think this is a great idea. You know, if we all have to be at home, um, we can learn about different te technologies that we can possibly go back to using when we get back to the lab full time. I don't know how it is for everybody around the world. In our labs here, it's a half-half system. So we have half the students come from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then half the students come from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. So it's really, it's been disruptive, but you know, it's it's somehow functioning. And right now it's of course more difficult with the spikes in the, in the, in the virus. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today it's probably something that's a little bit different than and I think what I saw most speakers speaking about. So I'll have a couple of images of fluorescence in there, but I'm going to talk about something that's called chemical microscopy. And I think Stephanie already told me earlier, she alluded to it. She has some, quite some experience with this. So it's basically going to be Raman microscopy where you can make the invisible visible, but you can also make things that are visible invisible. And so you can make your life a little bit harder as well. And so what I'll tell you is a tale of kind of both things where we've we've tried to capitalize on the advantages of this technology, but also realize that there are problems in, in trying to do this and when it comes to complex environments and in cells. Okay, so before before I, I launch into the science, just talk about the people that have kind of worked with me along the way. So particularly just in this vein, right? So it'll be three three students one of which who's graduated from my lab and a couple that are still there, that um, the, the folks that have graduated are on the bottom there and then the people that are still around are, are, are on top here and they're sort of split between the MPI and mines and uh, UT here in Austin. And so the people that are highlighted in orange there are the folks that uh, I'm working on a lot of the things that I'll talk about today. And then I've had a lot of collaborators, uh, not the least of which are you know listed there. Um, at some point you just run out of space because you have to also include all the funders there. And so, there's a lot of people that have helped along the way. And so I want to give all of them credit before we start talking about everything, because in case we run out of time, it's important that you see the people that actually did the work. So here they are. OK, so what is this chemical imaging and why is it, what, is it important, right? So it's not really a difficult thing to stress to this audience, but right, chemical imaging is the fundamental basis of what an MRI is. In an MRI, when you're looking at tumors or you're looking for lesions, 
particularly you're looking at proton. And so protons and their relaxation different ways are the only contrast that provides you what you're seeing primarily in an MRI, unless you use a contrast agent. And so the big question of course is, you know, you want to find out where the tumor is so you can find out where the tumor, where the surgeons cut. And that's the goal, right? But an MRI in the best case scenario, right? If you have like a 7T magnet, that's super cool. Then you can put a human in there, which are rare. There are a few of these on the, on the planet right now, right? These have a, a, a resolution of about a hundred micrometers. So think about that, right? You're, you're about a hundred micrometers. That's, you know, at minimum, you know, I would say at maximum 10 cells resolution, you'd say probably even less if you're talking about the spread out cells. And so, right, chemical imaging, right? You can also do this thing where you can do this so-called um, vibrational or chemical microscopy, right? With, with which I'll show on the right here, the, the traditional histology, which is H and E staining, where you can stain a, a tissue slice and you can see where the nuclei are in the cytoplasm are with these two different colors. But you can also lay over that something where you've got this sort of chemical contrast. Whoa, what happened there? So chemical contrast, where now what you've got here is you're laying the on, on top of this image, right? The H and E stain, which has something on the order of 300 nanometer resolution, right? You can easily see individual cells now, but you can see now different depots of lipids and proteins that are marking different types of organization of the brain tissue, which are impossible to see in the H and E. And you definitely cannot see at the MRI level because they're just too small. And so this idea of chemical imaging is it's giving you optical resolution with the advantages of potentially looking at the features of a tumor, right? Or any other type of pathological tissue, which you can see with something like MRI, but combined into one, right? So now you know where to cut and you're seeing what you're seeing, what you want to see, which is the intrinsic contrast of the, of the tissue itself that's uniquely been modified by that tumor. And so... This chemical microscopy is the ability to then map, right, the composition and the structure of molecules, right, in a diffraction limited way. So you currently, it's mostly diffraction limited, although Reiner Heinzmann has done a, a pretty nice job of trying to make uh, Raman microscopy actually super resolution. And that's, that's a challenge that's been kind of evading some of the people in the field that I work. And generally speaking, these technologies are rather minimally invasive, right? In the same way that you can go to an MRI and produce an image of where a tumor is based on, on protons, right? You can produce an image of a lot of these chemical features that you see. This is one example image in a very nice paper where it's showing a hepatic triad. And you can see where nucleotides are, collagen is, and proteins are just by looking at different bands within a chemical spectrum, right? And so let's say the summary of what I'm trying to say is you can more or less see how much of of what is where with optical resolution with, with pretty much no sample prep, right? You can just walk in there and do what you wanna do. And so what sort of stuff am I talking about? And so these, chemi these, chemi these, these chemicals or chemistries that we're talking about are basically all the intrinsic things that are within the tissues or within the cells that we're interested in looking at. So water has unique vibrations. So we're talking about bonded molecules that, that, that vibrate relative to one another. In this case, it's kind of shown in these animations with water, you have these two H's that vibrate relative to the O. In lipids, you have these, C, these H groups, these hydrogens that vibrate relative to the, to the C's and actually the, the CC double bond also vibrates. And so basically anywhere where you have two atoms that are bonded covalently, you have them vibrating with some characteristic bond energy. And so then the question is, how do you probe that, right? And so probably many people in this, in this talk know that you can probe things like electronic molecular modes. So things that are electronic in nature with fluorescence, right? That's how we do fluorescence is we're probing a so-called electronic state. We're not probing these vibrations. We're probing, we're probing electronic states. And then we do UV vis to see where those states are. So you can do UV vis for vibrational microscopy, vibrational spectroscopy as well. And this is just something in the case where you move the, the incident wavelengths from the visible and the UV to the infrared. Because the infrared are the energies that are resonant with the vibrations of these atoms relative to one another, right? The bonded nuclei are vibrating. That's what you're probing. And so infrared light has the right energy to probe those particular vibrations. And so you can put in incident infrared light and then you can get transmitted infrared light just like you would a UV vis detector. Right, and then if you had a microscope, you can map that. And actually now there are some really, really good technologies out there to do infrared based imaging. The main challenge with most of them is it's really hard to do this in anything wet. So water is a real challenge for how much 
signal it absorbs and the ability to almost effectively boil the tissue that you that that you see there okay what you can also do is you can hit it with visible light on the other hand right in this case literally like a laser pointer and you'll see that most of the light that comes off that that sample is going to be exactly the same wavelength that you put in because we didn't label this right so of course I'm, I'm sort of glossing over the idea of autofluorescence so we're going to sort of think about that as not being a major problem, although that is a real challenge with Raman microscopy. But in general, most of the light's going to come out of the same color that you put in. And if that's the case, then that's called Rayleigh scattering. But some of that light's going to come out at slightly longer wavelengths and even slightly shorter wavelengths. And those are called inelastically scattered light beams. And in those cases, those tell you something about the vibrational energy of what you're looking at in a sample, right? The difference between the energy of the scattered light and the incident light tell you something about the energy of what of what the vibrational modes were in the particular point where you focus that laser. So the composition of what's there. And so that looks something like a spectrum like this. And so what you see here, right, is you've got these funny wiggles here. And in a sense, right, I think I want to make the contrast between what you might be familiar with with the fluorescent spectrum and what you see here. In a fluorescent spectrum, you see things that are sort of broad on the scale of 50 nanometers for an emission peak. And it might move if you've got a pretty unique dye, maybe some excimer peaks in UV vis for absorption. You might see some smaller, some smaller absorption lines and narrow absorption lines. But I would say in general, it's kind of lumpy and you don't see as much structure in the peaks as you do in vibrational spectroscopy. And so here you've got a bunch of different spectroscopic vibrations, right? Molecular modes here. And to be perfectly frank, it wasn't people like me that came up with what these ident identifications were. That was done over the last, you know, honestly, about 95 years since the technique was developed, where a lot of chemists really sat down and like went through the Sigma Aldrich catalog and then actually did a bunch of quantum chemical calculations to validate what these different modes are in these spectra. And so this is tabulated in a sense where it's almost like a library that you can use to then go identify different molecules by seeing a spectrum like this. So very similar to NMR in that sense. And so what can you do with that, right? You can now map things. And so you can take this and you can say, all right, well, I'm gonna take a spectrum that I get at each point in the cell. So you can image with it, right? Cause you have optical resolution. So you're going along, you build a raster scan, every little point here, you get one of these spectra, okay? And then you can do multivariate analysis on that, right? And you can highlight different cellular organelles. And so this is an older example, and I like it because it's one of the original ones, but there are many more that have happened since then, where many other organelles have been tracked, all of them using a variation of, about, of the same idea, right? So this idea of a lot of unsupervised learning that has become very, very, or maybe even supervised learning has become very popular in the recent, you know, five to 10 years with machine learning. The kind of, the, the groups from astronomy and mass spec have been using unsupervised, really sort of like arguably really straightforward methods like principal component analysis or cluster analysis to do a lot of similar type of processing, but we're doing it on hyperspectral data sets like this. Right, and they've been doing that for years. And so and the people in the Raman community really just ported those tools to their data and were able to sort of apply them. And so in this case, what you see is the ability to highlight where the mitochondria are in the cell, but do it right only from the information, this molecular information that you get, right? Where the CH2s are, where the CH3s are, all of these different modes, and you combine them in different ways to be able to highlight different structures and cells. So that's kind of cool because in this case, the only reason why the, 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 mit the mitochondria are tagged is to be able to validate the clustering that's been shown, but in principle, you don't actually need it, okay? So you can do this with extrinsic tags. So this sounds like a really good idea, right? It's got, it's chemically specific. You have this diffraction limited resolution, right? So that's really good. And now, you know, with certain developments, you can do it as a light sheet. You can do it in, um, in, in, in super resolution as well. But the real challenges with this is, is that the efficiency of this process is just bloody really small, right? We're talking about like one in 10 to the eighth photons is, 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 is Raman scattered versus if you have a fluorescent molecule, even a relatively old and maybe inefficient dye like Fitzy, you have a quantum efficiency on the order of 0.6 to 0.7, right? So that's, I mean, if you want to talk about it, it's 60 or 70 out of 100 photons, which give you a fluorescein fluorescence. And now we're talking about one in 10 to the eighth. So just kind of think about that, right? More information content here, 
but the price to pay is a ton of waiting time to get any signal. And so the most ways that people do this, this imaging is they use, they use what is called Stokes Raman, which means that the Stokes Raman, if you excite with a 532 or a 48 laser, it spectrally overlaps with your fluorescence, right? So all of that Stokes fluorescence, even autofluorescence in that case, which can be pretty substantial from say, for example, glass substrates or tissue culture polystyrene, that's really, that's really enough to overwhelm your Raman signal so you don't see anything. So you have to do something slightly more exotic to be able to get these signals in the traditional sense when using linear Raman. And so that's something where you have to, you know, you sort of calcium fluoride or magnesium fluoride substrates, and you have to do things like, oh wait, maybe I have to blast my sample with, you know, 100 milliwatts of light to bleach all the fluorescence so that I can then see the Raman that's underneath it, okay? And so the question is, how do you overcome these challenges? This is why I'm here, is to talk a little bit about how you do that. So I didn't invent what you're gonna, what I'm gonna talk about here, but I've sort of developed it in a way that has made it quantitative to do a lot of the science that we do in our lab and uh, other people are doing in other labs as well now. And so what we do is we do something called coherent Raman scattering. And so this is where you use a couple of different lasers. And what you do is you've got a pump and a Stokes laser and the energy difference between these two, right? So this is the end, this is kind of an energy scale here. The energy difference between these two is tuned to vibrational moiety or vibrational energy that you're interested in probing, right? And I showed you that big spectrum and that big spectrum, it has the units of these so-called inverse centimeters, right? Or wave numbers. And that scale is just basically one over lambda of the pump and one over lambda of the Stokes. You can think about that, the difference between them, that's what it is. And so if I tune this to particular resonances, right, the, the energy between them, you can see here that when you have both these, both these lasers present at the same time in the sample, you get the sum and you get the difference, right? And the difference is the red, which is the envelope at infrared frequencies. And the sum is, is the sum frequency, which is at frequencies that are well beyond even electronic excitations. So they don't really affect much that you're trying to see. And so this red envelope is what we're interested in because that's giving us the energy that we need to indirectly probe the vibrational energies in the sample, right? This chemical information. And so if we put those two in together, we can use this to excite vibrations. And now if we probe that or we scatter a third photon off of that, a probe photon, which is usually degenerate in the same wavelength as, as the pump photon, then what you generate is something called anti-Stokes Raman because now you've excited this vibration, right? In the bottom, you've got the pump and the Stokes that come together, you excite the vibration, and then you hit it with a probe photon. And so what that does is it scatters that vibrational energy into the so-called anti-Stokes photon that comes out, which is blue shifted relative to all of your lasers that came in, right? So in doing so, you sort of got rid of the autofluorescence problem, at least a linear autofluorescence problem, because now if you excite with a blue laser or let's say a green laser, you come out with a with a blue with blue light, right? So instead of having exciting green and coming out red, which you would do in fluorescence, it's exciting green and coming out blue, which you would do, you know, in multi-photon fluorescence. It's a multi-photon autofluorescence is not necessarily the most strong thing in a lot of samples. It is there, but it's not as strong as the linear autofluorescence for say. And so now you've got this, this anti-Stokes Raman and you're actively pumping these Raman modes, right? With this, with this combination of lasers, of, of photons, the pump and the Stokes at different energies. And so it allows you to be able to image at now no longer taking, you know, one and 10 to the eighth photons, but you get about a 10 to the six, 10, 10 to the sixth, 10, 10 to the seventh fold increase in photon flux. And so now you can do things like you can image in real time when you're looking at particular Raman vibrations, right? So if you just care about one of these energies, you can tune your laser difference to be right on that, on that difference. And you can now image this like you were looking at a confocal laser scanning microscope or a two photon microscope. And you can also combine this with all sorts of multi-photon fluorescence to be able to sort of do combinatorial, you know, chemical microscopy and fluorescence microscopy at the same time. And because everything is kind of label free and your wavelengths are in the infrared, you can do this for 24 hours, you know, imaging sort of one frame every, you know, five minutes and things don't die. Things even divide in this case, what I'm showing here. And so you, you have a lot of flexibility and a lot of abilities that this affords you because now you can see things without labels if you're interested in them, right? Which I am. 
and the reason I'll, I'll explain shortly. And you can also do this for a long time and have optical resolution. So you have this sort of all these combinations at once, but you don't need to have a long waiting time to be able to get the information you want. And so now this is for a single line, but you can also do this, right, for this entire spectral thing. And this is what my lab specializes in. So we don't do this in real time necessarily, but what typically happens if you do this slowly, more slowly in a Raman microscope is you spend sort of minutes or at the very, at the very fastest, maybe seconds or hundreds of milliseconds per point to acquire one of these spectra, right? And so what we can do in our lab using this coherent version of this, right? We've sort of developed some ways to go from what's a nonlinear microscope to almost, I would say, linearize the data right, with some data processing, which I won't talk about here, to be able to do this, where you can sit at each point now for on the order of like, you know, let's say tens of milliseconds or even one millisecond and produce a spectrum of that quality, right, what each point in, in the sample. And so you can produce an image of this, let's say, you know, 512 by 512 on the order of minutes instead of hours or maybe even what were formerly even a day, okay, to get the appropriate number of photons. And so now you can integrate different bands, right? So just like in a fluorescent spectrum, except now I have a lot more structure here and more information, you can integrate these different bands to produce, of course, simply just an image of, in this case, where are the CH2 vibrations or where are the CHT3 vibrations? And you see that they're not entirely overlapping in this particular fixed HeLa cell. And so if I overlay them, you can see what's where, right? You can also even see some sort of protein condensation in the nucleus, probably from histones as well. And so that's something that, you know, you have the ability now to be able to look at entire macromolecular classes in a sample without any labels, right? And now to be able to visualize where they go. It's so that's something that if you think about it, it's kind of unique and is also difficult, right? So this is where you make the invisible visible. It's really hard to look at all lipids and all proteins in a sample. So just stop and think about it. How do you look at every single protein in a sample if you wanted to look and ask a really general question about what happens to proteins or lipids say, during cytokinesis, right? Everybody knows what happens to certain proteins or certain parts of the nuclear envelope or, or cell membranes during, during cytokinesis, but how hard is it to ask what happens to all of them or entire distribution of them? That's a difficult question because you can't label every protein in the cell. It's almost impossible to do that. Now you can see every protein in the cell if you're interested in that question, you can see every lipid as well. So this is where you can make something that was invisible visible, but what I'll show later is you can also make something that was visible invisible by doing this in too complex of an environment. And so one thing that's unique about these spectra is they change not just based on the composition of what's there, but based on the structure of what's there. And so particularly in my lab, we're very interested in the protein structure. So how different proteins are structured, whether they're monomeric. In this case, I show a monomer and an amyloid of lysozyme. And so we know that amyloids have much more beta sheet content in general compared to monomers. And so if we look at these spectra, we can see that there are subtle shifts here in the amide one and amide three vibrations that sort of tell us that these two things have different structures. And so, you know, one goes from really narrow and kind of let's say on the I'll call it this on the on the on the blue side of this one. So the, the tan one here is a bit to the right of the black one here, and it's narrower because amyloids are more crystalline, so they have a narrow distribution of vibrational environments, the chemical environments, and it's slightly more beta sheet, which is on on the on the right side here of this MI1 compared to the the black one, okay? And similarly for the MI3. So you can really see the difference between a beta sheet and alpha helix just by looking at the, the details of what are in these spectra. And so why is that so important, right? I mean, probably not too surprising to most people in this audience here, right? But protein structure is intimately connected to, to, to biochemistry, right? If you wanna have reactions on proteins, phosphorylation or some sort of kinase activity or phosphatase activity for that matter, you really need to have binding sites available. And so the structure of the proteins matters because if things aren't available, if they're occluded, then you have a, a, a very different environment for different enzymes and also different you know proteins to interact with one another for example on cell surfaces with um with or integrins with, with different proteins on, on surfaces or with enzymes that are that can degrade polymers which is both of those that we work on in the lab i won't go too deep into the the biochemistry side of that but more so into the imaging side of that and also these things are very very famously associated with alzheimer's disease where you have uh, a curiously large number of these these beta-rich plaques 
in patients with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's that are not there in patients without that. So there's some sort of a correlative link there. Okay. So this is what we're interested in is using these microscopy tools to sort of investigate pathogenesis that are driven by multi-scale chemical changes in tissues. And so we sort of look at protein structure inside of matrices, protein structure inside of cells, and then lipid composition as well, because that's something we've developed over the years is how to do um, some pretty unique lipid composition imaging as well with these methods. So what I'll talk about first is, is the protein structure in matrices. And so this is something that not many people really work on in this space because the the max photons that you get in this type of process are usually for looking at lipids, so you can go the fastest. But when cells pull on tissues or when tissues are, are deformed by external forces, for example, by our movements, these tissues are made up of different types of proteins, right? Collagen, fibrin in certain cases, elastin. These are the structural moieties that build the tissues which our cells live in. And the variations of the structures of, of, of the proteins within these tissues is capable of, of potentially driving different bad behaviors like metastasis and also affecting different things like blood, blood clot stability when it comes to fibrin matrices, okay? And so I'm interested in fibrin. That's something that my lab works on quite a lot. So fibrin is a, is a, is a protein which forms the polymer scaffold for all of the blood clots in your body that, that you want and don't want for that matter. And so basically, you know, heart disease and, and stroke are some of the leading causes of death in, in the developed world. Actually, almost one in four, some of the reading statistic I read, deaths are related somehow or another to thromboembolism or heart disease. So some, some sort of blood clot based problem. And so you have a lot of people that have fibrinolysis problems and fibrin, uh, fibrinopathologies. And so this is a, a significant problem is understanding what is the ability to basically look at these these, these blood clots and treat them appropriately with enzymes to be able to stop a lot of downstream pathologies that are associated with them. And so fibrin is made up of this hierarchical polymer. So it comes from fibrinogen and fibrinogen has, has, it has two fibrinopeptides which are cleaved upon local release of thrombin. And so these things then well, turn into fi from fibrinogen into fibrin which are just the cleaved versions of fibrinogen and they for form these kind of double stacked um, protofibrils. And these things, these protofibrils, which are half staggered from one another, can bundle to make to make a protofibril bundle or a fiber. And then fibers then can branch to make full three-dimensional networks. And then these fiber networks, which are you know something on the order of let's say 20 to 30 per 20, 20 to 30 percent of the mass of a, of, of a blood clot, the, the rest of it being mostly water and also red blood cells or platelets. Um, they form this mesh which encompasses everything and stops stops people from bleeding at the location of where they started to to initiate that that bleeding out process. And so uniquely, what what's interesting about fibrin is it's got this unique coiled coil structure with the connector in the middle, these red things. And if you pull on it, at least in a computer, that these fibrin molecules will unfold from this highly alpha helical state here to these beta sheet and unfolded regions here. And so that was predicted in 2012 when we started doing this. And so what, what happens is mechanically with fibrin, right, it's a, it's a biopolymer, semi-flexible polymer. And so when you do rheology on it, it's got a linear region here, and then it's got a stiffening region here, which is believed to be from entropic elasticity, something that is kind of unique to most biopolymers. And then it's got even more stiffening in this region here, which was purportedly believed to be from monomer unfolding, but had never been seen. And so our question was, all right, you know, if you've got this unique ability for the fibrin to, to basically unfold within a matrix, does that somehow tell you how the, how the system is distributing loads within that matrix? And then number two was, okay, if you, if you change the structure of these molecules, is that somehow related to the biochemistry that is making it potentially difficult for the body to break down these clots and causing a lot of death? And so we are very interested in both these questions. And so we, we have worked on this for a while, and I'm just going to throw this in here as, a, as to those that are interested in any sort of, you know, composite material science. I think this is a really nice paper last year that came out that did a lot of mechanics of fibrin, right? They didn't do any imaging that I'm talking about. They did mechanics of fibrin to show for the first time, at least computationally, how loads were distributed into a biocomposite fibrin network, which is not trivial to do due to the properties of fibrin that I'll talk about now. But anyway, small plug for that. So, why are we interested in fibrin and how can we use this with our Raman imaging, right? Or our coherent Raman imaging. 
So if you unfold these molecules from coils, right, to sheets, the hydrogen bonding is what's changing along these things. And that is what is causing the shift in this amide region of the spectrum, right? This amide region is actually the carbonyl that is modified by this NH group. And depending on the environment of, the, of what basically the peptide bond, whether it's in a helix or in a sheet, the, the location of that particular peak in that, in that band will move, okay? And so that's something where we basically did an experiment where we took a fibrin sample, we stuck it on a car's microscope, we pulled on it, right? And then we can see that it's, when it's relaxed, the peak is located around 1635 to 1640, right? And if you pull on it to about 100%, the peak moves to about 1665 or 1670. Right, so you have this about 20 to 25 wave number shift to the right, higher wave numbers, when you pull on this fibrin gel, and it's still fibrin, right? It's the same material, but now it's just structured differently from an alpha helix to a beta sheet, okay? And so if you, if you do this, and you do this spectral decomposition that I'm showing here with all these different peaks, and now you do this over a whole bunch of different, you know, positions in the sample, right? At 0% strain, if we don't strain it, what you see here, as you see, mostly this thing is, is helical and it's uniform, right? The, the, the percentages aren't really that important, but what's important here is the fact that it's relatively uniform here and relatively uniform here. Okay, what's happening in the edges here, are, this is actually part of the, 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 the sample that's, um, that's on the very edge and is not necessarily very well attached and has been pre-strained in the way that we mount the samples. And so the bulk is actually kind of uniform in the two cases, right? And so in our microscope, we have about, actually about 400 nanometer resolution because of the excitation wavelengths that we use. And so if you now pull on the sample, right? So we've embedded beads in there to make it like sort of a fibrin clot, right? Which you have these platelets and red blood cells inside and platelets are about three microns and our beads are three microns. Now you see something very interesting. It's no longer uniform anymore, right? You have these bands where you have more beta sheet and bands where you have less beta sheet. And they happen to be somewhat concentrated around the location of where these beads are. And so the distribution of loads, right? The distribution of structures in this case, the beta sheets of the alpha helices, which are in fact just the inverse of these images, can tell you that the loads are directly not distributed equally within that sample because the different parts of the, of the, of the sample are not unfolding to the same extent, right? Which makes kind of some sense. It's a polymer sample. All of the strands are not aligned. And if you look at an SEM of this, right? up to 400% strain, you see that you have this kind of banding where multiple different polymers, which are about 100 nanometers or 200 nanometers in diameter themselves, they send, they sort of tend to make a super fibril or a superstructure upon stretching it, right? And some of these are more resistant to deformation and they will not unfold whereas others will. And that's what we found in this, in this work. And so basically if you do this at different strains and now you map how the structure is changing by looking at each pixel, right? You get one of these spectra, then you decompose that and you can get the amount of beta sheet and the amount of alpha helix. You can see that as you strain these composite samples, you get more heterogeneity within them where you've got a uniform sample here. It gets slightly heterogeneous, maybe a little bit, a little heterogeneous here. And then it's even more heterogeneous and more beta sheet like as you pull even further. And so that's something that you really can't see any other way, right? Because here you're looking at a single protein in a hydrogel and you're able to map what its protein structure is and the distribution of that within this material kind of for the first time, because there's no other way to probe the secondary structure of that material or that, that polymer, right? In situ while you're measuring it. It's just not possible. You could do X-ray scattering, but you'll never, that's not an imaging technique. That's, that's totally bulk. And so even though my resolution is only about 400 nanometer, 400 nanometer, right? In next Y plane for an X-ray scattering system, you're looking at sort of centimeters or millimeter sizes of beams, actually not centimeters, millimeters, okay? And so then, you know, I, I brought the question of, okay, well, maybe this thing affects biochemistry just to kind of finish this off. Well, it turns out that that's not just a hypothesis, that's true. So, you know, if you pull on a fibrin gel, the degradation rate goes down and that has been shown before we ever worked on this problem. And so then our, my hypothesis, which we've actually now kind of proven, and so we have a paper on the bioarchive about it now, is basically showing that there are different parts of the fibrin gel that unfold under, under tension or shear forces. And those parts are 
basically resistant to fibrin degradation by enzymes because those are the load bearing parts of the of the clot. And so if you think about this from the perspective of a blood clot on your elbow or something, you don't want the parts that are load bearing to be the parts that are actually going to be falling apart when you um, when you when, when you attack it with enzymes because in doing so you would be sort of taking out load bearing walls in a and think about it in a house or in, in a bridge or a structure and it would fall so you want to take out those parts of the of the scaffold that are not load bearing so it's got this intrinsic mechanochemical feedback loop which is kind of cool okay so that's imaging protein structure outside of cells right that's pretty easy because now we have only one protein there. So we know the protein is fibrin. There's nothing else there. So everything we know that we're looking at, we know is fibrin. That gives us a signal. That's cool. So what about imaging protein structure in cells? Well, this is a harder problem. And so it's important for things like cancer metastasis and um, drug delivery, which I'll talk about not really so, so much here. But it's, those, it's very important to know how the structure of, of proteins are within cells. If you could measure this, right, for many, many reasons. And so, okay, it's a pretty simple question, right? Can we find a protein within a cell? Absolutely we can, right? GFP actin, since at least the 40s, you get beautiful images, it's fantastic. But I argue it's a lot harder to figure out its structure. The only way that I know to figure out structure of proteins in cells is to do things like FRET, where you doubly label a protein, you know, with a GFP on one side and a CFP on the other side, and you do FRET between them, either via sensitized admission or acceptor photo bleaching. The thing that's really challenging about that and also not necessarily obvious about that is I have never seen, at least in my looking at this, I've never seen a polymeric protein like actin, tubulin, or intermediate filament proteins ever labeled in a FRET experiment. So I'm yet to see a paper where that's actually shown. I've seen parts of those proteins that, that scaffold onto those in focal adhesions that have been labeled, but not those proteins themselves, because I think it's kind of challenging to get those proteins labeled with fluorescent proteins that are 15 KD or 25 KD on either side and really not disrupt their function. I think that's difficult to do. And so that's a challenge that's, that's been out there for a while. And so the challenge that I have now, right, is I can see protein structure, but I can only see it for the protein that I care about, right? And so that's, this, this is basically one of the greatest Where's Waldo problems, if you remember this from when we were kids, right, is you look at a picture here, and you're trying to find Waldo in that picture, right? My protein and a cell that's full of proteins. And in fact, it's got 200 mg per mil of proteins. And so how do you do that, right? It's really hard, Waldo is here. Probably you couldn't see them in that slide, or maybe you could if you're really, really good. But for me, it took me, you know, tens of minutes, if not longer to be able to find that. So this illustrates the scale of the problem, right? I'm looking for something that looks, right? Has the same chemical structures, the same CO bonds, the same NH bonds, the same CH2 bonds as every other protein but it's my protein of interest full in a sea of things that look identical. So how do I solve that problem? So I talked to you everything what was label free, but in this business, right, we also have labels. They just happen to be small labels and they're isotope labels. So people in NMR or neutron scattering have used isotopes forever to be able to distinguish, you know, things of interest from the background. And so this isn't necessarily super exotic. It's just more exotic in the context of bioimaging and microscopy. So people mostly do it in these kind of bulk experiments, like I said, NMR and neutron scattering, but in biology, it's not so often happening, although now I would say it really is. And so we sort of demonstrated this idea on a Trojan horse or a cell penetrating peptide called penetratin, where we put some deuterated glycines on the N, N terminus side, and then we added a biotin on the, on the C terminus side of the peptide, and the peptide is known to sort of ghost into cells by going through the plasma membrane via various mechanisms that are still debated in, in the literature. And so basically what we were able to show is that if you've got this deuterated glycine tag, right? These are full of now carbon deuterium bonds, which are very stable over days for half-life exchange, right? We can see now a unique carbon deuterium peak in the region where there is typically nothing in a vibrational spectrum. So between about 1800 wave numbers and 2,800 wave numbers, you have what's called this quiescent or blank region. Nothing is happening there. And so if we image the cells, right, and we look for this particular fingerprint at 2,200, right, there's nothing else there. Only thing that's there is the stuff that I put there, right? It's my carbon deuterium because deuterium is sufficiently scarce in nature that you don't have that much carbon deuterium bonds inside of cells, okay? And so if you look at this, this, this peptide with fluorescence, right, 
and we image it sort of, you know, relative to the DNA in the cells, right? We can take the same cell and image it with all the proteins. These two are the same cell, right? But now we can look and produce an image where we can see only our peptide of interest, right? Relative to all the other proteins that you see on the right here, we can produce only our peptide of interest and we can look for the DNA in the cells, right? So we can see both. So now we can at least find our protein within a cell. That was difficult because how do I tell my protein from other proteins when they all have the same chemical structure? So we can find that, that's good, right? We have lower sensitivity, that's obvious. And for the reasons that we talked about earlier, because the, the scattering process is just inherently weaker than fluorescence, right? And so now if we do some statistical processing on that, we can figure out where the protein, at least in different segments of the cell, looks like it's in a helical conformation versus in a sheet con in, in, a, in a sheet conformation. And so that's the first time we can sort of localize a protein within a cell and tell you what its secondary structure actually is. All right. And this isn't imaging it. And I'll talk about why it's not imaging it later. But basically, the, the process you have to go through is a lot of multivariate statistics to get there, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. And so, okay, now that was a little segue. And we had to we had to do that experiment to be able to demonstrate we could actually resolve our protein of interest pull its spectral fingerprint out and then do decomposition on it to analyze its, its protein secondary structure. And so now let's go back to the actual experiment we wanted to do. So this experiment was basically a parallel experiment to what was done in the mid or kind of late 2000 decades, around 2000, uh, mid 2000, so 2004, 2007 or so by the Dan user group, where they were injecting a lot of fluorescent labeled actin into cells to do fluorescent speckle microscopy. So we did that exact same protocol except we did it for intermediate filaments because intermediate filaments are part of the load-bearing cytoskeleton, which again has this unique feature where the proteins will undergo secondary structural changes because they're full of cold coils, just like fibrin, um, when you pull on them or push on them. So in, in vitro, it had done that and in silico, it had done that also in single molecule experiments. And so what we did was we took some cells, we depolymerized the vimentin cytoskeleton with the drugs, the pharmacologically, we produced deuterated vimentin in E. coli using um, a, a, mi a minimal media, which we sort of verified. And then, and then we showed it could be competent with normal vimentin to make, to make gels. We injected that deuterated vimentin in cells, so the red dots here. And then we washed the drug out and we allow the, the cytoskeletons to reform. And then we start imaging those samples to see where we can find where the inclusion of our deuterated vimentin is relative to other things in the cells. And so if you look at these images here, they're formed from these different bands in the spectrum. So again, all, all protein, you see this entire, excuse me, this entire mass of, of distribution of, of protein. And only for this deuterated part here, do you see a little bit where the vimentin is, right? And we can only see again, because of concentration limitations, where the vimentin is more concentrated. Okay, and we validated this numerous times in, in uh, single line imaging and fluorescence to show that these two actually do co-localize the native vimentin and the deuterated vimentin. And so in our experiment, we were very interested in how the forces on cells can, can modulate how the protein structure is, 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 is folded, whether it's in this helical or sheet conformation for this vimentin protein. And so we modified the protein structure both pharmacologically and mechanically. So Glass is our control where cells are spread and they have really high tension. If you put them on sub soft substrates, cell will, cells will develop a lot less tension and will be much more rounded. And then if you put them on hard, hard substrates like glass, but you add blebostatin, it's a non-muscle myosin 2 inhibitor where you basically reduce the contraction within cells. And so the pre-stress of their preload goes down substantially, although they're still spread out. And so these, what you're seeing he, here are GFP um, lentiviral infected cells where we, where, we, where we have a GFP tag and we can see the structure of the, of the cytoskeleton directly, uh, the morphology at least, not structured directly from the fluorescence. And so what we do to produce the, 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 the fingerprint of these proteins is we do multivariate analysis. So I, I, I highlighted it before, but I sort of glossed over it. And so I'll talk about it here. Is so we take all the spectra in this case, you know, whether it's, it, it's usually about 500 by 500 spectra, okay? We segment the parts where we find this particular vibration. We take those spectra only, and then we shove them into basically a linear decomposition, which is particularly smart, called multivariate curve resolution. And so it's a variation of principal component analysis with a rotated basis set, where all of the different components that you identify are forced to have all positive values 
along every spectral component. So you can't have anything negative, okay? And so basically now you generate this linear decomposition of pure components by their con con concentrations. And so in doing that, you can generate components. And so in our case, we generated two different components. So we can tell how many components to generate. One of them, which was a background component that we called because it did not have our deuterated protein component of interest in it. And the second one, which had our deuterated protein component in it. And so this was our, our protein of interest, right? Our D protein in this case. And so this now allows us to extract the chemical fingerprint of that protein. In this case, if I mentioned that we're interested in looking at, okay? And so now we can get this on a single cell basis. So now think about that, right? We've, we've localized this protein within a cell using an isotope label. And now we're able to pull out its, its spectral fingerprint averaged over a single cells and the reason for that is because of the signal to noise that's required for the spectral extraction, okay? And so if you look at this, this is just a comparison between pure vimentin fi filaments that we polymerized in a gel, and then what you see the average protein structure in cell and the average vimentin structure in cell. And so you can see for the red case here, you've got this kind of massive CD location here, and the spectral fingerprint there is, is ugly because of the computational reconstruction of the spectrum. But what we showed in our earlier work was that the amide reconstruction was entirely accurate to what you would expect for the protein going in. And so that was in a, in, in a, in a, in a model system. And so in this case, what you see is the brown, they look sort of like they overlap, but they really don't in the end. Because when you look at a very high resolution here at the spectra, you see the shift again from, from the native case here in the gel that's and now again shifted about 20, 30 wave numbers to the right to the to the beta case. And so now if you look specifically of, of, of cells on glass versus soft substrates or on these drug treated cells, what you see is that on glass on the blue, it's more shifted to the right. And so when you put them on a self substrate or you or you you treat them with this drug, that the spectrum shifts to the left now. So it goes from being an unfolded state, higher tension with this beta sheet, when you pharmacologically treat it or, or, or mechanically reduce the tension, it goes from being a beta sheet to an alpha helix. And so you can see that shift. And that's the first time that people have been able to see that, but it's been hypothesized for a while because they couldn't sort of determine the protein structure within cells, right? And so here it's just a quantification using spectral decomposition of how the structure changed within cells, okay? from these different spectral fingerprints that we isolated. And so the implication of that is again, biochemistry, right? So you can change now the ability for vimentin to be recycled within cells based on how much tension that the cells are under. And so people have shown that the amount of, of, this, of this kinase is not really changing whether the cells are on soft or stiff substrates, but the amount of binding of the kinase and phosphorylation to the vimentin cytoskeleton is changing for that. And that was kind of the reason was sort of hypothesized that they were under tension, but why was that happening? And so now we know that vimentin is under tension when it's on a hard glass substrate, but also the protein structure is very different than it is the secondary structure of that compared to when it's on a soft substrate like a collagen gel. And so the amount of the amount of phosphorylation is going down substantially in that case that 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 is consistent with what the hypothesis was previously. And so in this case, right, I just kind of want to summarize at least this part of the talk. So we made the invisible visible, but we also made the visible invisible, right? So if you do this coherent Raman scattering, we can see protein secondary structures in situ, right? And in a fibrin gel, it works really, really well because it's only a single protein there, right? So I can image the protein and tell you what it looks like, right? But to do this separation of these proteins in a complex environment, like a single cell, I need to introduce a label, albeit maybe a small one, where I exchange hydrogens for deuteriums. But I have to sacrifice all of my spatial resolution to pull out the spectral fingerprint of what I want to see. Because now, each pixel, right, what's in each pixel, right, I, I see everything in that voxel with my Raman microscope, right? I don't see just my protein of interest. I can't only see that one. I have to see everything. And so I need to isolate my protein of interest from all the other contributions of other things within that voxel. And that's now a difficult problem. So then I have to basically sacrifice my spatial resolution to be able to produce that, that spectral fingerprint, right? And so compared to fluorescence, this coherent Raman scattering can be fast for a single mode and actually can have comparable, although still lower sensitivity, 
but it also maybe has lower sense, lower perturbation, right? If you're thinking about the scale of the label that we're adding in this case, right? And so the goal of ours to map protein structure of the events inside a skeleton is a work in progress. And so I think we have some, we are implementing now some ideas with nearest neighbor um, subtraction and machine learning to be able to sort of maybe try to still retain the ability to image this protein structure while at the same time pulling out the spectral fingerprint that they were interested in, right? So, okay, to summarize this, right, you have vibrations for every molecule. So they're not so bulky that you, you know, um, you don't need bulky labels to find them, but it's really hard to find these molecules inside of cells of interest without small labels. And it's even harder to pull out their spectral fingerprints unless you do something where you have multivariate statistics to, to basically pull out the fingerprint with some high fidelity. Otherwise you're really in trouble there. Okay, it becomes more challenging. So in that case, I can make it visible, but then I also make it invisible, right? Where I, it's hard to find that spectral fingerprint. I've now lost all my spatial resolution. So I no longer see its distribution. That's kind of the theme of the talk. So, okay, with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Yeah, I think Kilti, I mean, you have only seven minutes for your next um, event. Is that right? Yeah, I've got, well, I, I have to lecture it. I, I have to lecture it. At, at nine, so I have an hour, but I can take questions for another okay, five or 10 minutes. Kitty, you have kind of looked through the questions. Yeah, I think Stephanie, it's just you and me asking questions. Yeah, so. you've kind of been excited. <laughs> yeah. sure. so one of the things was on, on slide number 29. Um, uh, how, how, did, how do you deduce, like, yeah, if you go on that, that couple of, yeah, the next one. Yeah. This one, yeah. So from this fluorescent images, how do you deduce alpha helix and beta sheet light? Yeah, so you can't, right? It's, in, it's the one in the middle where I deduce it from, right? And so I deduce this. I didn't explain it here. I explained it here, mm -hmm. right? This, you deduce it based off of multivariate curve fitting. Mm -hmm. So what you do in this process is you give your data set, which is in position versus spectra and you need to have a lot of spectra for this to work at all. In fact, you need to have more spectra than spectral data points that you have. Otherwise the problem, which is already overfitting is even more overfit and has absolutely meaningless information that comes out of it. So you need to have, you know, in this case we have 700 spectral data points. So we have, you know, uh, this is a 512 by 512 image that we put in there or many 512 by 512 images. And so for each one, we have this, you know, 512 by 512 by 700 this dimension. And so what you do then is you do a linear decomposition on that in a rotated basis set. So if you just type in PCA into something like MATLAB, it will do this for you, right, in about 10 seconds. But the difference is that that will give you both positive and negative spectral components across the spectrum, which has nothing that you could identify as anything from reality. So what this does, on the other hand, is it does, rather than a matrix decomposition, it curve fits each one of these spectral data points and the amount that they, and what their shape is, and then how much they contribute in all the spectra that you have. So it's doing an iterative curve fitting for each of the spectra to match, you know, and minimize the chi-squared error on the reconstruction that it produces. And in doing so, it, it just so happens, and I can't explain why, it just so happens to make sure that the deuterated part here comes with the deuterated protein that I added. So they are they are they are spectrally reconstructed appropriately, versus like the part that is not deuterated does not have that same shape to it. It's like a good problem for deep learning. But someone is not the any problem for deep learning. Uh, if, if if we go back to the image, um, it seems like your your specific protein on yeah, uh, these look like more like if you see in green for example the alpha helix, right? Look like the high fluorescent areas in the first image, right? Yeah. So how do you normalize for some bias that, you know, you will automatically detect more proteins which have more fluorescence and then kind of looks like a bit contrasted. Just maybe. Right. So what, what we did in this case is um, we segmented the images based off of what the spectra showed us. So we knew that spectra that were towards the edges here, right, yeah. were closer to lipids. And so we would see a larger lipid peak. And so we took those. And so we first segmented based on just having the CD, yes or no. And then from that, we said, okay, we know certain, certain parts of the cell have certain features of them and we can segment those now as well. Mm -hmm. And so then we took, okay, 
you know, parts that were lipid-like and put them in another basket and part that was showing things that were nucleic acid-like and put those in a second basket. And so now we separated those two and then did the decomposition on those. And so that's one way that we sort of are able to kind of like minimize the bias in the two groups is by recognizing where that they exist. In the case for Vimentin, we can't do that. So we don't have as many spectral data points. So we just had to bin everything together. And so in that case, we do see what is most dominant and we cannot see the heterogeneity. Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, Stephanie, shall I ask two questions from Emmanuel and Sandra? Or yeah, sure, want... yeah, no, go ahead. And then I gave you the whole stage, right? So you can ask questions and then have the quiz. So... Emmanuel asks impossible questions, no. <laughs> So, uh, Emmanuel, you want to ask question yourself or shall I ask uh, on your behalf? <laughs> you really want me to ask a question? Yes, go ahead. I so, love you. I mean, the technique is fantastic, but one of the issues for us is we're working into 3D tissues in organoids, which are in a bioprint, so they are very big. So do we have any hope of at some point being able to get that print, that car's picture in the middle of an organoid? Um, good question. And I would say the answer is I don't know right now, but I think it's plausible. So the, it, the way that I did everything here was in transmission. So we've done stuff in 3D hydrogels. That works okay because it's still transparent. The organoid is possibly not transparent because it's so dense, I guess, right? And so you can do this in sort of a reflection or, or an epi direction, but the signal is often extremely weak unless you're doing it in an animal where you have tons of backscattering. So depending on the amount of backscattering, you might be able to produce the information, but you, there, you, you know, it's going to be a question of how long do you want to wait for it? Thanks. Sure. So next question is from Sandra. Sandra, do you want to ask your question yourself or? Yeah. yeah. Hi, um, hey, how are you? Fine. Very nice talk, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if there are some genetically encoded um, tags already available or something if people work with artificial amino acids or so, which they yeah, can- Yeah, so then... all of those are true. And so there are, there, there's a very, couple of very, very um, well-known groups now that are at Columbia that have developed an entire suite of tags that basically even vibrate at different places within this band where they can, they can tag your protein of interest with 10 or 20 different tags. I mean, it's not like the molecular probes catalog where you've got a billion tags, right? But you got 20 different tags and you can look at them at very different locations. And so for localizing molecules, there has been a huge development on the chemical side to be able to you know, produce different types of functional groups and unique tags to be able to find things. The only drawback of those is, well, not drawback, those are meant for primarily imaging things that are otherwise going to be difficult to image or that you want to see for long times, right? Because these don't bleach. That's the other thing that's good about them. Um, they don't really provide you the ability to do what I did here, which is then extract a spectral fingerprint from that. Because that is, that is fundamentally something that is very challenging in that particular environment. I think it could be doable, actually. But I think the more that you try to fill in that area with numerous different types of tags, the harder the extraction becomes. Okay, thank you. So Stephanie, now you have three, four questions. Uh, go ahead and then we will have the quiz. Well, I guess one question I had from my own experience, which is like now a long time ago, it's um, the cause um, imaging works really well for when you have large numbers of molecules. Yes. Kind of coming together when you have a glomer, it's like lipid droplets, obviously, were like one of the first. Can you just maybe comment on this a little bit more? How, how yeah, you sure. See I mean, it's a coherent process, right? So the enhancement yeah. that you get is requires coherence. So that requires lots of oscillators in the same place. So that's mm -hmm. exactly right. You don't, there is no single molecule cars. I mean, some people have tried to do it. Um, usually it's plasma enhanced if it's going to happen. Right, and that maybe you could do single molecule mm -hmm. cars, but you could also do single molecule spectroscopy straight away, so you don't even need cars if you're going to do that. Right, those are the things that like Sumit tries to do yeah, a little bit, mm -hmm. and so you don't really um, have single molecule specificity here, so you need to see clumps in that sense. Right, mm -hmm. so you don't see individual fibers in a hydrogel, but you see groups of fibers. Right, you don't see individual fibers in Vimentin, but you would see groups of fibers. Yeah, I asked actually early in the chat line because I didn't, 
wait long enough because then you showed actually quite a bit of the work <laughs> which when the question was which molecules else can be imaged so i guess i mean you showed dna fibrin you um you lipids, do lots of lipids or lots other of ways. other things are coming along now so i think you right. showed actually excellent examples so yeah in terms of um intensity as well for the um, excitation or illumination it was always it was actually always necessary to really blast the cells quite a lot but i think that's also i mean you do live cell cause imaging now so i think that has also improved maybe also a bit of a comment from you yeah i mean i think it it's still pretty high i mean i don't think it's lower but i think the you get saved by the fact that you're not doing it with a you know a cw 532 laser pointer right mm. which is really toxic but mm. you're at 1064 or you're at 1200 and that is substantially less toxic because the absorption cross-section of basically water there is much lower mm. and so you're in a you're in the so-called water window so you still hit it with you know on our case, we do, you know, I'd say 20 to 30 milliwatts of average power with a rep rate coming of, you know, one megahertz. Yeah, okay. So it's not small, but it's not toxic. So it's still divide. Yeah, yeah super. No, very nice. I mean, it was very inspiring and I'm amazed and I really loved it. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks I don't have much. any more questions, but I have lots more questions, but I think your time is probably running out. So yeah, I got to prepare for class, but I mean, I'm happy <laughs> to fine. answer questions, you know, via email or whatever. That's great. I mean, thank you. Know, you. I'll thank be you very much. I mean, I think we do the quiz, which um, you have provided some questions and I'm kind of, maybe that's, I don't know if you want to stay, if who wants yeah, to Yeah, if stay, you do that relatively could, quick, then I got to, we can I do really the share run. screen now and then. Sure. I'll stop. Yep. Yes, uh, so there was a mentimeter i put it actually into the um in the beginning i don't know if people saw it i put it in the beginning i put it in again wait so in the chat box for those of you who want to play go and get your maybe your phone ready for this and then i share my screen um, i think i just probably do this that's okay and I think we have around 35 people, so. Yeah, that's fine. So I need to move my, okay, so. So I ask you the first question from the Mentimeter quiz, what is challenging in your imaging experiments? You can pick all of them or you just click some of them. I mean, I think it's an, we all have specific uh, requirements, some people resolution, some people specificity. And I think, um, I mean, CARS was obviously um, addressing a specificity without label. And um, and I, I think-, think um, I should remind that there's a prize also. So maybe- Yeah, so there's a prize at the end of the show here of this quiz. So you can buy, uh, you can win um, a fold scope so if you were cool. the lucky winner, <laughs> then yeah, this was the joke initially, because when we thought we were all in lockdown, we thought at least people could use a fold scope and actually play with it. You kind Do of can, home, right? you can kind of um, play as well, if you like. <laughs> I send you one. Actually, I promise I will send you one for getting up so early and kind of. So let's see who's signing in. I wait a little bit longer so we can have a few people. One more minute. Play. Maybe some people have issues uh, connecting, so. We have 10 people, so that's a good number. I mean, I, I, this is just the introductory. In the yeah, I think there are still 27 or uh, 26 people, so. I think a few people, people left people now. But, uh, I mean, we had about 100 people subscribing, so we don't always get our, everybody who's subscribing, but then we get more people as well, which sometimes we send out this soon. So if everybody is happy, then I go now to the... So, I, I mean, it's the typical core facility as well problem that um, if you ask people what they want, they want resolution, specificity, speed, and they want to <laughs> they do want it all in right? huge samples. So they always want everything. So, <laughs> so here are our players. So, um, so then you should get five questions and it shouldn't take so long. So imaging with hyperspectral Raman microscopy is, so if you probably look at your phone for this, it's actually easier than similar to fluorescence in terms of speed and information, slower than fluorescence with more information, faster than fluorescence with less information or faster than fluorescence with more information. So thank you for 
providing this. And you see most people have got it right. And maybe some people knew it already, but hopefully some people also learned. I mean, it's slower than fluorescence, but it gives you more information content. And the next question, I mean, it should really be a review of the learnings from the talk. Um, the phenomena probed by Raman scattering can reveal is the question. And then the molecular composition, the structure in addition to the composition of the molecules, and it requires specific labels to get any signals. And then you have to be careful because it could be A and B, A and C and all. Okay, so more, three people only got A and B. So again, of the questions have the answers have to be a certain number of um, letters. So sometimes they're a little bit shorter than number three. Coherent Raman scattering can look at your phone, improve the imaging speed compared to spontaneous Raman, the video rate when done for a single frequency, suffer fluorescence background contamination, A and B and all of the above. The time is up. All right, so A and B was correct. Very good. Still get five people getting it right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, it's sometimes hard because with the A and B, you have to read it very quickly. And yeah. so this is about speed as well. Macromolecular specificity and coherent Raman imaging, I like this, requires nothing, it requires some sort of label. It's limited to fixed samples, so it's incompatible with fluorescence. You make your choice. I like the requires nothing, but Unfortunately, it does require some sort of labor, which is um, okay. So, question five, the last one. Yeah, just depending on speed as well, obviously, if you can win. If achieving a spatially dependent Raman fingerprint of a specific protein with coherent Raman, and That's then so you have five sorry, options. That's that. a bit long. Yeah, sorry. It requires special, special background free substrates. It's very challenging. It's trivial at this point. And I think people realize, so it's like very challenging and, current, and currently rudimentary. I think D challenging, but possible. And um, yes, sorry, I I, so, uh, so well, you see, so the final, the final kind of solution here, these were the people who played okay. and then um, Marcello, whoever Marcello is, actually was the fastest and got the most answers right. So, so Marcello, if you let me know, either send me an email or fold scope's um, on the way. Fold scope will be on the way <laughs> for you as well. So, <laughs> okay, okay, thanks very much. So, this is I stopped sharing my screen. Congratulations, Marcello. Cool makes a very smart comment. Marcello, can you teach me reading this fast? <laughs> yeah sorry uh, i think it was I, I didn't sometimes... realize that it was that slow actually I, otherwise i would have had uh, i would have put much less in the answers it's okay sometimes you have to say i know uh, <laughs> the, the, the speaker today we were together oh, you do ah, there <laughs> i haven't you seen you I haven't, how are you doing at the mp mp <laughs> yeah how are you everything fine here in london yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was an amazing talk also. So, yeah, thank you very much. It's good to see you. There's a lot of old friends there, yeah? yeah. yeah. Between you and Sandra and Kirti. It's, it's nice. <laughs> yeah, no, it was I mean it was um it was really a privilege and actually learning so much and really inspiring as well. Great. So if people have much. questions obviously about Raman, you know, we in, I mean, especially if you're in Cambridge, I think we know people who can, we no longer probably provide really Raman imaging, cars imaging, but we have um, Sarah Bondik and our institute, for example. So if you were inspired and you want to have more questions answered, if you want to kind of ask people from the organizing team more questions, or if you want to actually ask Sapun directly. Yeah, just email me, it's fine. It would be great. and. That would be a wonderful outcome also from this. So thank you very much, Sapuni. I know you want to rush off thank probably. You. And thank you a lot. And 
Bye bye. Bye. See you. Bye.